just did a really interesting case and I thought it was a perfect learning example for differentiating uh, cervical radiculopathy versus a peripheral neuropathy. So uh, it was an 81 year old lady, uh, very spry, witty, active, with zinging pain in the elbows and arms. She said anytime you tap on the elbow, it just zinged up and down above and below that. And so this might seem like the classical Tenel sign with a cubital tunnel entrapment. But what was really interesting on her is she did have a history of uh, prior cervical fusion and a history of thoracic outlet syndrome with a rib resection. And so that alone makes you start thinking, oh, is this really a peripheral neuropathy or is this a radiculopathy up at the cervical nerve roots? And both of those can present as weak grip strength and zinging down the arm. What was really interesting with her is that, um, well, normally it's really difficult to differentiate the two because they have so many overlapping signs and symptoms. But the little nuances of the clinical exam actually lined up perfectly with a T1 radiculopathy in her. And obviously the prior cervical fusion and thoracic rib resection for a thoracic outlet syndrome do clue you in that there might be other pathologies going on up there and I'll talk about that in a minute. But let's just cover the clinical signs of how to differentiate the, the neuropathy versus radiculopathy. So one of them is just understanding the anatomy. So the T1 nerve root, it comes out from between T1 and T2 here and joins up with the brachial plexus as this uh, lower trunk and division. And because of that, uh, as happened in this lady, she had zinging that was going down even into the forearm but it was basically ending at the wrist. And that's a little unusual because normally with an ulnar neuropathy, you'll get uh, numbness, tingling, pins and needle sensation into the fourth and fifth digits. She did have a little numbness in the fourth and fifth digit, but the zinging itself, that sort of shooting, she, she described it as like electrical, like she felt like she could blast electricity out because it was zinging her so much. It ended at the wrist and she had major numbness on this medial forearm here. And the ulnar nerve does not actually do sensory innervation of the forearm because it, that actually comes from the median antebrachial nerve, which comes out a little higher from basically C8 and T1 nerve roots. And so the fact that she had all these symptoms in the medial forearm, but then ending at the wrist clues you in um, that that is a, a radiculopathy rather than just a, the neuropathy in the elbow. Second thing was, um, yes, there was some weak grip strength, but normally with an ulnar neuropathy, you'll get the thaner atrophy and the weak adduction or adduction, which is includes like the Froman sign where you'll, you'll hyperextend the DIP of the thumb. And she did not have that at all. She had full thaner musculature here and no Froman sign. And uh, what was interesting though, is she did have weak thumb abduction. And with a, um, with a T1 radiculopathy, the weak muscles will actually be more in the thumb abductors, abductors, and also in the opponent's muscles. And that's because those muscles are also through the C8 and T1 nerve roots, which come through median nerve. And so she did not have the classic ulnar adduction or adductor weakness, but she did have abductor weakness. So again, that's a big differentiator between a peripheral ulnar neuropathy and a T1 radiculopathy. Next thing was she had full numbness and tingling on the entirety of the ring finger and not just on half the ring finger. With an ulnar neuropathy, you'll usually have uh, some pins and needles tingling on the fifth digit, um, the pinky, and also half the ring finger, but hers was entirely through both digits, which again is a nice clue for a T1 radiculopathy. So obviously in these kinds of cases, it's important to get an MRI. And in her case, her MRI showed a very interesting feature. The primary thing being a multi-level spondylolisthesis where the upper thoracic vertebrae had slipped off the vertebral column to essentially cause a neuroforaminal stenosis or a tightening around the T1 nerve root. And that T1 nerve root is what comes into the brachial plexus here and eventually contributes to the ulnar distribution primarily, but also a little bit of the median nerve. 
And so um, that's why a T1 radiculopathy presents somewhat differently than just an isolated ulnar nerve compression. And there's probably a couple reasons that this happened. The main one being that she had had previous fusion surgeries in her cervical spine, including after several revisions, uh, C2 to C6 fusion. And it was sort of this straight up and down, almost like cement pillar, like a very uh, vertical column of fused cervical bones that was just standing on this C7 and T1 base. And because of that, Normally, below the fusion, you'll get adjacent segment disease, meaning like a degeneration and a herniation of the disc below the level of fusion. And she certainly had that. She had degenerative discs and degenerative facet arthritis and all sorts of things because the facets are kind of the last thing holding the joint in place here to prevent further slippage. And those joints looked worn down and uh, very arthritic. And in her case, this entire column was basically plunging forwards and diving off the vertebral column and so instead of just a pure degeneration it was slipping forward as well and because of that she had some significant kyphotic deformity of basically the sagittal imbalance of leaning forward which has been shown to be a significant contributor to pain um, as well as dysfunction so for all those reasons, in addition to the fact that she had had this T1 uh, rib resection for her thoracic outlet, that also can be destabilizing in a way because even though it had happened decades earlier, uh, it takes away this sort of support through the sternal um, attachment here and that T1 now is able to be more flexible and eventually mobilize almost like a pseudoarthrosis. Normally the thoracic vertebrae are quite stiff, but in her case did eventually result in this spondylolisthesis.